Hi there, it's that GOAT Kaizen and Masters Madrid is right around the corner. So today we'll talk about what it will mean for the final four teams to lift that trophy as well as their strengths, weaknesses, and how they can do it. I usually talk about each team's odds in these final four videos, but in all honesty, it's anyone's tournament to win. Also, thank you for helping this channel get to 5k subscribers. I've been really busy with work and my part-time studies that I haven't really mentioned this milestone in a video. Really appreciate everyone who decided to hit that subscriber button even though I haven't been asking for it. I'll probably do a video on this milestone specifically, but till then I just want to say you all are awesome for making this happen. So let's start off with Loud, and I think for them if they win Masters Madrid, you kind of have to cement them as Valorant's first dynasty. And yes I know Fnatic exists, but I kind of made a video in the past talking about how I believe it takes more than just one year to be considered a dynasty because we've seen it in the past where teams have been red hot and then the following year they just could not adapt to the meta or the level of competition catches up and they're just not as dominant. But in Loud's case, they've been through multiple metas and player changes and still been quite dominant. Like in 2022, they won champs. 2023, they won the Americas League, one of the most, if not the most competitive regions in VCT. And in 2024, if they possibly win Masters Madrid, they've proven themselves they can do it over a long period of time. And they would be, in my opinion, Valorant's first dynasty. And plus those champs points will come in clutch. Because at the end of the day, what do you think those America's teams are doing? <laughs> I guarantee you they're not just sitting on their hands. They're getting better. They're watching these matches. They're going like, oh, okay, this is a weakness that we can exploit here. Oh, this is great. We're going to borrow that and use that in our team's comp. Like, at least I hope that that's what they're doing, right? I hope a lot of those America's teams are in the lab getting better. So getting those championship points will be coming in clutch for them because it's not going to be guaranteed that they make it to Seoul this year. Same thing with Shanghai. Even though the championship points don't really apply to Shanghai, that's something different. But you still get the picture. Like getting those championship points is going to be clutch, especially in the world's toughest league. Now, when it comes to like naming a team's weaknesses and strength, you kind of have to be nitpicky because if they got here, it's because they also know what their strengths and weaknesses are and they play to those advantages. So they kind of already know to an extent like how to mitigate their weaknesses to a point. But without a doubt, there's been a lot of questions around QCK. And it's fair. As the team's duelists, you usually expect them to be top fragging. And outside of the EDG game, when he's on Jet or Race, he hasn't been like the top performer on Loud. He's done a lot better on Phoenix, but Phoenix isn't like a dive duelist anyways. They have a breach and their Phoenix and their breach kind of play similarly where everyone just util dumps to either take the site on offense or to retake it on defense where it's a team effort to take those sites rather than just expecting one person to dive onto site. And I think that kind of like mentality is a blessing and a curse at the same time, right? Because you're not really expecting one person to lead in frags. It's going to be a team effort. So where maybe the other competition in this game are expecting their star duelists and one other person to get top frags. In Loud, you don't know who you're going to get it from. Like the obvious choice is a less, but you, we've seen Sadak do his thing, not just because of his aim, but because of how he positions himself. Tuez has been able to get it done in the clutch, and Kaozin has been looking like a little bit of both those players from time to time. I think most teams' game plan is going to be to pick maps where they want QCK to beat them when he's playing either Jet or Raze. But even then, their Breeze still looks pretty good. So if QCK can start clicking heads like he was against Edward Gaming, that's a recipe for success in my opinion. Because we already know the rest of Loud is going to step up too. For Gen G, I think if they win Masters Madrid, they will be immortalized, right? Because at the end of the day, there's been multiple past trophy lifters and people have kind of forgotten about them. But it will be different for Gen G's case because it will be Pacific's first trophy lift as a region on the international stage. And it's not because of a lack of talent because we've seen with DRX, they've shown immense amount of skill just to get out of the group of death in Champs 2023. They even beat Fnatic on Bind by a lot. They just weren't able to get over that hump. And then we know about Paper X always been known as second place fiends. But if Gen.G gets it done, a whole region will never forget about that. And this could be Riot's dream story too, right? Because Charon got pretty much picked up from rank. And if you've been watching those like promotional videos in Champs 2023, Riot is really trying to sell on that story to everybody that you can go from rank 
to being crowned as a world champion. And if Caron's able to do that, Riot's just going to be salivating, obviously. They'd be like, hey, we told you it's possible, and they just proved it that it's possible. Plus, getting another three championship points is going to be clutch for them. It pretty much all but guarantees them a spot in Champs 2024 because they already got three for the kickoff tournament and then another three, which is double that. So unless they have like a massive fall off, which I don't think they will, they're all but guaranteed for Seoul, which will be on their home turf. And you guys already have heard me talk about Gen G's strength, which is just they play very standard Valorant, but those fundamentals are really good. And sometimes that's all you really need where they work the map together, they take site together, they retake site together as well. You rarely ever see people overheat, but it does happen, but it's not like a characteristic of them to overheat. I also mentioned that in the past, one of their weaknesses could be having a lurker where teams can just punish them. And we kind of seen that with Edward Gaming on Icebox where they punish Meteor for his aggressive lurks and their adjustment to that was just not to have a lurker, which isn't the worst thing ever, but Ever Gaming were able to just get free real estates on flanks. And I think Gen G can learn a lot from Carbon Core in the sense that if you're gonna put someone on an island, make sure they have like a possible escape option. Whereas Shin was usually put on an island by himself a lot, but because he was playing Omen, he could TP into safety and get out of those like sticky situations so the team could retake together. Or they could just have another person with the lurker where they don't have to like push aggressively. Instead, they could just like hold each other while they get like map information and whatnot, as well as play like more of a 2-1-2 where you have Charon, who you can argue is their best aimer, just hold mid and watch mid while they continue to get more of an idea where everyone else on the enemy team is. And you can tell that they've been using their time off to draw up new comps, which have been looking quite scary they're the only team in this tournament so far to have won a game with yoru and their split is looking kind of scary too if they keep this up pacific may have their first ever global champions now for paper x them winning masters madrid would like help them greatly in dodging those choker allegations and this could be a catalyst for them to win more trophies in the future and in turn they can kind of like rewrite history and as we know now history is written by winners and the narrative will go from always choking to those past mistakes as just being a stepping stone for them starting their own dynasty aspirations. They already have a pretty solid resume of finishing in the top four in past tournaments. All they really need is a trophy. Now for their strength and weaknesses, um, it's quite similar to Louds, honestly, where their strength is their flexibility. And it really helps when you have the world's best flex player currently in Forsaken. Like, I don't want anyone talking about Forsaken's agent pool. This, this is not a pool, it's not a lake, it's an ocean. This man is swimming in the ocean. When you ask certain players what role they play, they either say, oh, duelist, controller. Forsaken says he plays Valorant. That's his role. His role is Valorant. And we see their flexibility the most on the map like Sunset, where they're running no duelists. And in my opinion, they're the best team on this map currently, until proven otherwise, because they beat Team Heretics, the same Team Heretics that gave Sentinels a lot of problem. I think at this point, we could say that they're the best on Sunset. But not every team can copy this kind of play style because first of all, you need flexible players, which can kind of like help cover some of their own weaknesses too. It reminds me a little bit of Evil Geniuses too, where they weren't really seen as the most flexible team, but they were able to make those pieces interchange and cover up each other's weaknesses, which is one of the weaknesses that people like to say is Monyet. I don't like to blame one person for a team's failures because we can look at the same team in Paper X and Masters Tokyo. They were able to get to the third place finish with a content creator, right? If they're able to do it, then you can't blame one person, right? It's, it's a team-based game. And if someone keeps dying or they're not fulfilling their role, that's the team's problem. That's not one person's problem. Like if you have a Sentinel who's always dying on site by themselves, then that's the team's fault for not adjusting to like maybe bring another person there or tell that Sentinel, oh, just back off and we will retake that site as a team instead of you just always dying on site by yourself. Same thing with the duelists. If your duelists keep entering on site and they die by themselves, maybe you change up how you entry on site. Maybe instead of going one by one, you go together as a team. You change up your utility patterns, stuff like that, you know? So at the end of the day, I think the biggest weakness for Paper X is themselves. Like if you've been watching this team for the past year and a half or even longer, they are their own greatest enemy. When their vibes are good, when they're laughing, when they're smiling, they are the best team on the planet. And when they're not laughing and when they're not having a good time, they might as well be my ranked teammates. You know, so as long as they're able to like keep being the most unpredictable team with their flexible players and comps, Paper X could lift up Pacific's first trophy ever too. And lastly, we have Sentinels. And honestly, it would be weird to say that 
they're officially back if they win Masters Madrid because they've already had the hardest road to get to this point anyways. They beat the best America's teams in the group of death that was incredibly stacked. Like each of those teams in there could have qualified for Masters Madrid's playoffs. And then they had to go through the best EMEA teams at this event as well. Now for strength and weaknesses, we can say that Split, Lotus, and Sunset are their best maps. Borderline world-class, right? Icebox is kind of questionable since we haven't seen too much data on them, but that could also be beneficial because other competitors have less data on them while they have more data on those competitors. However, this team looks the worst whenever Tens and Zekin are not on their mains. You can see a performance dip when Tens is on KO and whenever Zekin is on Jet doesn't defeat the fact that they might be the best team here on split but other teams are pretty good on certain maps that sentinels are good on too like paper x who in my opinion are the best on sunset so far and then we got to think about gen g whose map pull kind of hard counter sentinels where they're really good on breeze and ascent same thing with loud's breeze too it's pretty impressive even though i think against loud sentinels might want to roll the dice with us on ascent but who knows and the reason why i mentioned tens and second is because they're seen as the team's carry like if you watch podcasts and just the way they talk about their unit you can tell that their game plans are built around zekin and tens doing good so if teams are able to shut them down, they're kind of in trouble, but they still have world-class talent in Saucy who's shown flashes of just dominance. Same thing with an IGL who can shoot back with John Quentin Tarantino and the Vibes man himself who's also gotten in clutches too. So when teams play against Sentinels, it's more like you got to pick your poison, right? Because they will come out and give you a run for your money on Split, Sunset, and Lotus. But you can only ban two maps. And in all honesty, every single team at this event has like weak and strong maps too. So that's another thing that you have to take into account. It might be a reason why teams are playing Split because their other maps aren't as dominant as we may think. But let me know down below who you have winning and why. Till then, I'll see you in the next video.